Now, if you haven't learned about effusion yet, I recommend that you see the video on effusion before you watch one about diffusion, uh, because diffusion is actually going to be basically the same idea as effusion. The only difference is that instead of effusion, where it's going through a small hole and fast molecules are escaping, while well, heavy ones are having a harder time finding that hole, it's going to be that one gas is moving through another gas. I jokingly call this one the he who smelt it dealt it rule. Uh, that's not actually factually correct because that's actually more about thermal eddy currents in the room and things. Uh, but still, effusion is that basic idea. It's all about how far out something is propagating from its source and how quickly it is as it's having to collide through another gas. Now, it's going to use the same formula as effusion uh, as our uh, proportional rate to get a more uh, specific rate where we're actually talking about how much time does it take to move a certain distance, we'd have to have more information for that. And there's a whole nest of other equations that you use for calculating diffusion and effusion in those kind of cases. But for our purposes at the Chem 1 level, they're going to use the same formula. Now, remember that when we talk about a gas, we're talking about what we call a random walk process. And that's because as, and of course, these are all moving around, but we'll just pretend that these gas molecules are static. Uh, the reason that we can do that is don't forget, yes, they are moving, but in the moment that it gets there, it was in that spot, right? So we'll just pretend that this is almost like a map of where things are at in each given moment over time. If this red molecule starts out right here and it happens to be going this direction with a certain velocity and it ricochets off of this collision and bounces that way, then that way, then that way, and it just keeps on bouncing in randomish directions, now you might say, wait a minute, is it always going to be a random in each of these cases? I'd say that in the ideal gas law, we assume that's the case. And we are dealing with so many molecules in the ensemble that there's no difference between saying it's random all the time or it's kind of random, but not really. We don't need to go that far. We don't need to decide whether or not there's a root cause or if it actually bounces off in a geometric fashion. We don't care. We're just going to mention that it bounces off in what is effectively a random direction and goes off on its merry way, and that these vol that these uh, speeds, these velocities, are going to be constantly changing uh, as they distribute their energy back and forth. Now, in the process, notice how long this path is, and notice also that I'm cheating a lot. These are packed in a lot more closely than a gas molecule would be. I'm also forcing this to be in a two-dimensional plane instead of in three dimensions. If we had the ability to move up and down along with this, this thing would take forever to get from one end of this to the other. And that's what we're talking about in, in an effusion process. And that's why in my joke, he who smelt it dealt it, the foul odor of someone deciding to not excuse themselves when they had a bean burrito, well, that was more about the thermal eddy currents. If we are relying purely on the random walk motion, it would actually take a really long time to get to your nose and life would be a much simpler and happier place. But that's not the world we live in. Instead, we live in the diffusion world here where we're focused on this process instead. Now, over time, the random walk process will result in an even distribution for all of your molecules in normal circumstances. And here's where I'm going to deviate from the slide a little bit and talk through something that I find interesting and that people often jump in on as well. Uh, you often hear about nuclear processing facilities and how they're set up in covert areas and they use um, rotors or centrifuges to do their uh, purification. What's really going on there is you take uranium, 235 and 238, you're trying to separate the two, and those numbers are referring to their masses. So it's the 235 isotope and the 238. They want to collect the 235 because that's the radioactive one. 238 is actually stable and doesn't fall apart in a nuclear reaction. So what they do is they slap six fluorines on that. And keep in mind, fluorine is a fairly heavy atom in its own right. Uh, fluorine is uh, 19 Daltons times six. Then the weight of the uranium, we're talking about a really heavy molecule. However, the fluorines around it and the uranium in the center, the fluorine is definitely more electronegative, but that means you have a fairly uniform shell of negative charge at the surface. And so they don't stick together. They stay in the gas phase. Now, they don't act as a perfectly ideal gas because that negative charge sitting on the shell on the outer uh, orbital of the atom, or of the molecule rather, 
it's going to be slightly repulsive to other uranium hexafluorides, but not so much that it can't be explained with ideal gas law approaches, at the early stages at least. So you've got this, and they're repelling each other, but when they're far enough apart, they act like they don't see each other. Now in that moment, it might be harder for them to approach each other, but they're going to repel off with the same energy that they lost as they approached. So it's going to effectively be what feels a lot like an ideal gas when we're looking at these calculations. Even then, we're not going to plug it into the ideal gas law. We're just talking about the concept here. So how can they do purification on uranium hexafluoride? Because keep in mind, these heavy molecules are only going to be different by three Daltons. They're going to be very close in their masses. Well, here's what's going to happen. If you put it in a really fast-moving centrifuge, uh, and the centrifuge is going around in this or in this direction, right? So spinning like this. What you're going to see is that your heavy molecules, the heavy uranium-238 molecules, are going to aggregate a little bit more on the outside. In the inside, you're going to have a little bit more of the uranium-235. So what you can do is you can constantly be bleeding off some gas from the very center, passing it to a next uh, centrifuge. And you can do this separation a thousand times in a row, and each time you end up keeping a bit more of the uranium-238 behind and passing a little bit more of the U-235 onto the next chamber until finally you get it to be a really high ratio of those two things. So I like to kind of call this uh, set of videos, effusion and diffusion, the Dr. Davies tells us how to build a nuclear weapon section. Now on the upside, I guarantee you all of this is super well known and the engineering challenges for everything that's involved that's really where the key thing is. The science in terms of the chemistry is not terribly difficult, so I haven't, you know, led to the downfall of civilization yet. Uh, we're working on it, but I haven't done it yet. So that's what's going to be happening when we're doing purification through diffusion.